you. Omakini homo yabemi, Nishinana memi wokumi, Lydum lily yabemi, Ustama hededi. Um, well, I'm really excited to be here at the finale. Um, I think we've had some really amazing uh, time together. Talking about, you know, from, I, I know I've been sharing history of the tribe, you know, before the gold rush, our experiences during the gold rush and where we sort of are today in the aftermath of all of that, um, the efforts that we've done through CHIRP which is our 501c3 nonprofit, whose mission is to preserve, protect, and perpetuate Nisenan culture. Um, as we were a federally recognized tribe up until 1964, uh, we were terminated by Congress. And so since, since then, <laughs> it seems like what I've been doing for the last, um, I mean, at least 15 years of my life, you know, going back to, this is an intergenerational um, struggle, which most native people fully understand that this is passed down in families, um, sometimes for many generations, which I find to be one of the biggest tragedies of everything that's happened uh, to the Native American communities is that it doesn't stop with one, one person who's out there, um, like it started with my grandpa and then um, my mom, she was the first chairwoman in Nevada City Ranchery and Modern Times. And, um, you know, now it's passed to me and I really loathe the idea that any of this would be on the shoulder of my daughters, uh, of the, you know, the, the governmental piece of it, trying, so we're seeking to have our federal recognition restored. And, <clears throat> excuse me, well, I've spoken with a lot of federally recognized tribes and their councils and their tribal members, and I've, you know, been, you know, been told, well, if you think federal recognition is going to solve all your woes, <laughs> you know, that's, it's um, not, uh, not the case either. Um, but at the very, very minimum that we have our sovereignty return, that we are still self-governing our people, that that tribal cultural fabric that held the tribe together before, that there's any remnants of that today, the social and political pieces of the families that are within the tribes, um, that any of it exists still after everything that was put in place to destroy that, starting, you know, with absolutely with the Indian boarding schools um, to break that culture. So when when I look and I, I look at the tribes and, um, you know, our guest today, uh, Herman and Melba, they're from the Washu tribe. And I see, you know, I see the culture that survives and that there are people there who are, you know, tending that and bringing it forward to the new generations that come. I, I mean, it's, it's miraculous to me. It's, it's just continuously, um, while it's hard work, you know, uh, I've struggled with learning the Nisenan language. Um, it's really hard, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, um, it doesn't, where I wish I could just absorb it in my DNA and just speak tomorrow. Um, we don't have any fluent speakers. And so, you know, it just, it ends up, it feels like, almost every topic ends up being a thing. Like, you know, I guess nothing comes easy that's has this heavy value. Well, that's the only way I can look at it without pulling out my little poor Shelly fiddle. <laughs> um, but I see the resiliency in tribal communities. I see the incredible um, strength in tribal people. And that too sometimes makes me mad. Like when, when does our family and our tribal people, when when do they get to be soft and just like lay back and, you know, not have the weight of an entire culture on the, on their shoulders? Um, you know, for for me personally, and I, I, I'm the spokesperson of the Nevada City Rancheria tribe. So most of the time when I'm opinionating on things, you know, I've gone through my my protocols within my family to make sure that I'm okay saying what, I'm saying, and I know my edges where 
you know, sometimes I can't even make an opinion from CHIRP's point of view as executive director. Sometimes I can't speak for the tribe in a certain place. And I do sometimes have my very own Shelley opinions that um, most of the time is back to what I just said is expressing this awe of the people in our tribal nations. Absolute amazement that anything exists after the, the campaigns against the native people on this continent and in California. Um, and sadness that the fight is so dang hard. Every step of the way to protect sacred sites, um, you know, to, <laughs> to be visible. Uh, for us here, the swiftness of the gold rush just, whoosh, you know, um, and then we're not in the history books. I never even, when I was in school, I didn't, I never learned about that time and what happened, the Indian boarding schools, you know, the mission system. Um, I, I made my sugar cube mission, I think, when I was in the third or fourth grade, or um, I think I made mine out of macaroni. <laughs> Um, I just, we were so completely erased. And while I learned from my own family, the truth, and I, my grandparents could tell me like where the old town sites were and, you know, um, grandma could sing songs in these not and new words and other family members knew words and some phrases, mostly in, it remained in song. Um, but it was all taken and destroyed and then erased. So, you know, now that the whole focus and uh, the package that's around CHIRP um, that holds the tribe in some kind of support and our efforts to restore federal recognition um, is to bring visibility, is to not only bring visibility for us at the Nevada City Rancheria, but to the truth of, you know, it's fighting against the Hollywood romantic, rom, romantic, romanticization, romant, <laughs> romancing of Hollywood with the Native American people, um, and really bringing like the truth out of what happened. Um, to these in hundreds and hundreds of these beautiful nations, so unique in their identity, unique in their geographic space where they lived, where their sacred places are, um, their culture and their dress and er their homes, everything, a complete reflection of the geographic landscape from which they lived on and from which many tribes will say, this is where we are from, literally, like we didn't come across the ice bridge. Um, we, we grow from this land and from this place. Um, and then, you know, there's the, the heavy side of protecting the, the dead who are buried all around our geographic tribal landscapes. So it gets to be this heavy, an important thing, um, you know, and this, this can inform people that don't maybe understand is like, well, it's, it's a pipeline, we only gas, yeah, well, it's going through a, a burial ground, like, I, I think maybe because many of the tribes didn't build the monolithic structures um, that survive time, that it looks like an empty landscape sometimes, and it's not, and um, yeah, I think with the, the importance of raising visibility is, is getting the, once people understand and they can see that folks are still here and sometimes that these cultures are still intact, is how then do we take modern communities who are living in our tribal homelands, obviously today, you know, they live here, they're part of this country and this landscape now. How do we, how do we make, not to say, um, sometimes I have to choose my words well, because I don't want to sound whatever, but, you know, how do we turn our local communities into the best allies? How do we get them to understand where we're coming from? 
and not get defenses up and not um, you know, if a private property owner has a site on their land, to not be afraid of contacting the tribe that we're going to um, take something away. I mean, to me, that's just absurd. Is like thinking of a, a private property owner today that would be afraid of us is just, it's so, it's like, wow, where do, uh, there's a whole, I guess it's because there's a whole conversation missing and people assume and le are led to their own assumptions, which lead to an outcome or a conclusion. Um, and I've heard that a lot of times locally that folks are afraid because they have a site on their land that if the tribe found out that we would come in and like stop them from, you know, fill in the blank, doing whatever. Um, and I really, you know, it is our tribe's point of view is that we have always wanted to be good neighbors. Uh, as far back as the family stories go, that at the onset of the gold rush, we've always wanted to be good neighbors. Like when you see the wave coming in and it's not going to change, this is happening. You position yourself in the best way to get along with people. Um, I know not all tribes are that way. Some are more, um, maybe more able, more capable, or have more warriors, are able to push back harder than, than our tribe is here. But I know that we always lead with, the, with that preface of, we seek to be good neighbors. We seek to be part of the community fabric again. How, how can, you know, I, I think we can only bend so much. There's not a lot to bend. We don't have anything, <laughs> you know. I feel we don't really have anything to offer sometimes. But our local governments, our local organizations, our local people who are living here now, um, you know, we need to make community. And that the people who have been here the longest absolutely deserve a seat at the table for whatever is going on that involves this landscape. And that has not been the case for since the gold rush. So um, I think, you know, I feel really proud of the work that CHIRP has done and the work that the tribe has done to raise visibility. I think everything that we do, we try to keep, um, you know, very, I, I, I mean, some people would say that I, I sometimes skip over the hard parts. Um, because you can only delve down into that, the muck of truth and, you know, so the, the really start the, the really hard stuff that happened during the gold rush to the people and then the aftermath of that. Um, I talk about it a lot and sometimes it's just, man, I, you know, I just don't want to go there again today. And so sometimes I do keep it light. Um, I know I have a really terrible sense of humor, so I laugh at a lot of things that are probably extremely inappropriate, but if you, I mean, I don't know what else to do. Um, and until these conversations happen, um, we all, I guess, float in the this weird pot of assumptions and guessing about what each other may be thinking or maybe wanting. So that part of um, one of CHIRP's programs, Visibility Through Art, you know, I have learned that using art as a method to have conversations that may be a little harder just to walk up to somebody and start talking about, you know, the genocide of the California Indian or whatever. <laughs> you, you know, you have these art pieces that lead people in um, kind of through a side door where, where defenses don't get up and they're able to enter the conversation in a different way. That program has been really successful for us locally. And I'm really proud of that program. Um, another program that's been really showing just a life of its own and showing how much the community is listening and how much they do care is our Ancestral Homelands Reciprocity Program. And that's um, an ongoing donation to CHIRP that people can just give monthly to support uh, all the work that we do at CHIRP and the different programs that are going on um, that obviously, especially in times of COVID, I mean, I'm, everybody knows that times have been rough, you know, um, for fundraising and for businesses and that kind of stuff. But it has been, it keeps growing. Um, it feels like it's got a heartbeat of its own now and, and that people are doing land acknowledgements 
um, wherever you are geographically, please, I really encourage you to find out who the tribal people are there. Do they have a nonprofit? Do they have a program where you can contribute your help in some way or your support? Um, or is it a tribe who would rather not have help and support? There are absolutely, you know, go figure. People have a lot of different opinions and different ways that they govern themselves um, tribally. Everybody's got a different experience. So, um, and then, you know, lastly to, when we did our visibility through art program, because we do work with a lot of non-native artists and you know, we have deep conversations about cultural appropriation and about, um, you know, how many decades, how many generations that other folks, academics and researchers and anthropologists and archaeologists and ethnologists and all the ologists folks out there have told our story for us, have um, sometimes as tribal people are standing there in the room, you know, they pull out the paper and they tell the story while someone's standing right there beside them who may have something to share, not that they always want to share and I understand why, you know. Um, it's just, it's about respect. It's about um, after a while when people study you and your stuff for so long and then tell you, give you the outcome and sometimes it's so far off from the actual reality of what the tribes know to be true that um, it's just very, very, very interesting. And, you know, I, I get myself in trouble probably be, for being so frank, but I actually feel that what's happened with some of our museums and universities and um, the people who have been studying the tribes for so long is the biggest act of cultural appropriation that can happen. I mean, going in and excavating graveyards and burial sites and burning grounds and keeping them in museums and university archives for study, you know, um, it's, I know it's slowly changing, but, and I know it just doesn't happen to only native people. Um, but that's the kind of thing that tribal people live with uh, all the time. I had always thought it was other people's tribes that unfortunately their ancestors were in a file cabinet somewhere and um, got to experience in the last 10 years that we have that as well. And being ill-equipped because we are not federally recognized, we have no, we have no support um, when you're dealing with the repatriation of ancestors in museums and universities. Um, you have to have that federal recognition to participate in NAGPRA and the repatriation of your ancestors. So um, it's amazing. It's amazing that our tribe could, that we were federally recognized, we were terminated. Almost all the other tribes have been restored their federal recognition and yet we have not. And that is, you know, the focus of what we're doing today, I know that, um, you know, with Deb Holland coming in as Secretary of the Interior, instantly we've got these Native American issues across the country that are, doo -doo -doo, I, they're starting to bubble to the top. And if I could only share with, I wish I could just jack you all into my head or, um, you know, any of the Native people out there who have been at the head of these, these fights um, for recognition and uh, sovereignty and um, getting your ancestors back out of the file cabinets and, you know, protecting sacred sites. If you could just get a glimpse at the years and decades and generations of people who have fought these, these struggles and you have somebody like Deb Holland come in and instantly you're starting to see like, like something's going to happen. And it's just so exciting to me. Um, our tribes are so important. Um, I mean, they're just, for me, the biggest thing, and I think I talked about this in either the last conversation we had together or the time before, but, um, you know, as people are doing traditional ecological knowledge and bringing fire back to the land and 
Um, I, I get asked things, you know, locally about how'd your tribe do that? What's your relationship with fire and all this kind of stuff. And while that's so important, um, because the absence of it is why we're having these catastrophic fires, because nobody's out there tending to the forests. <laughs> all the big herds are gone that, you know, would come through and help to clear stuff out and keep it nice. Um, the biggest piece in the middle of all of it is we can talk about fire, we can talk about acorns, we can talk about language, we can talk about everything, but as a whole, what I've learned from my my elders, my ancestors, my family, you know, is that the earth is sentient. The beings upon the earth are sentient, no matter how small. And almost every animal, you can see them in play somewhere. Like they play, they get scared, um, they have feelings and that humans are not supposed to be at the top of the ladder. We've positioned ourselves at the tippity top that everything else is dumber than us and we have more rights to the resources on this planet and it's just the way it is. We have more rights, we're better. Um, and I would say that until we can remember that and educate one another that that's not true. This is just simply not true. Um, I know even some of my closest native allies um, don't believe that. You know, we've grown up this way. This is the way we've been educated is that and what we see every day out there in the world is we can do whatever we want. Um, our memories are short. Everything's written down. I don't know anybody's phone number anymore because of my stupid phone. Nobody's. It's so weird because, and then I play in a band and I, part of my process of learning music um, was right, listening, to, I'm showing my age, play, press and rec, um, play on the cassette and pausing and writing down the lyrics. And now with all the lyrics on, on Google and everything, I cannot remember lyrics to my songs. And the memories that the tribal people had because most of the societies didn't write everything down, um, our memories and the stories that pass from elders, I mean, passing on that knowledge before you pass away to make sure your knowledge doesn't die. Like this is the core of of, I mean, I'm, I would say most tribal communities, that's, that's why elders are so important, you know, they hold the experience and the knowledge and, and kids, you know, you're, you're supposed, you don't really get hurt until you're proven and can guide yourself in a calm and smart an educated, thoughtful way, and, you know, we're all, none, I feel like none of America right now is, um, would be considered an adult in, wow, is that really weird to say? I'm sorry. Um, in some of the old cultural ways, like who would follow any of us? I don't know. Um, but I think it's so important to, to think about these things and to, if we could all go back to knowing that the earth is sacred and it's sentient. They have memories and they are, we are not the most important. I think we could dig ourselves out of the, the hole that we've gotten ourselves in on this planet. Um, and so while I know it's important to talk about fire and how did we do the forest and how did we do this and that, it, again, you're just like literally putting out a little tiny spot fire. Um, we need to address this as humanity and you know, obviously globally um, to protect the planet and these beings that are on it that are just going extinct left and right. And um, yeah, and I feel that without federal recognition, we have no safety net, we have no capacity to do the work and to perform in the way to protect the earth and its resources like we could. Um, you know, I just, I see some of the tribes who have depart great departments and they're, they're out there protecting their land. And, um, you know, with our guests today, um, we've got a really 
amazing relationship with the Washoe um, because we share, you know, they're on the eastern side of Nevada County. And um, I remember talking to some of the tribal members um, in the resource protection conversation and them saying, well, yeah, we know that you're our neighbors and because that like it's in their oral history. <laughs> and I was like, what, really? Because it's such a fight to like, we're here. Do you, does anybody know who we are? <laughs> you know, and then, and then here's the washer who's our neighbor, who of course, um, we shared a border. And so they were like, yeah, like you're real. And it was like, yeah, thank you. Somebody sees us, you know? So, um, but I, I've really enjoyed our, our time together um, over these last weeks. And the story walk is up. So the Anita Opet Betem Payam, I think I have my copy here. Um, this is our, uh, the book I wrote about my grandma, Anita Ope, and this is all in Nisanan, if you haven't seen it. Um, it's our Nisanan reader, and the story is by me, and then it is translated and illustrated by Dr. Sherry G. J. Tatch, who is our friend and linguist. And it's a great story. It is available in our chirp store, and um, I'm sure Megan can We'll put links up like she always does, but um, talking about language because our next guest is going to be speaking about um, language. Uh, we, like I said, we don't have any fluent speakers, so we rely on the archives a lot to go in. And I think I know, I know six writing systems now for the Nisenan language. Um, and it's, you know, it wasn't a written language. So um, this has been a great, a great project for me, um, for my personal family and my tribe. And someday, like I, our folks today on our call are modeling what we strive to have one day. We want our own language program. And I'm so excited to hear what's, what's up with them and how they're doing with their language programs. And so shall I go ahead and introduce Megan? Yes, thank you, Shelly. Great, let's see if I can actually have two windows open here. Okay, great. So thank you for listening to me rant and uh, I'm gonna introduce our guest today. This is Herman Fillmore. Herman Fillmore is the Acting Cultural Language Resources Director for the Washoe Tribe of Nevada and California. He started his journey with the Washoe language dating back to the 1990s as part of the Washoe Language Circle, which eventually gave rise to the Washu, oh boy, here we go, Washu, Wagaye. Am I close, Herman? Manga. Yes, Washu Wagayai Manga. Manga, beautiful. The house where the Washu is spoken. A Washu language immersion school where he went as a student. Herman graduated with his BA in Native American Studies from the University of New Mexico in 2012 and has been teaching the Washu language since. And shall I introduce Melba right now as well? Are you guys going to kind of co present? All right, great. Melba Rakow, is that right? Oh, sweet, okay, I'm good. <laughs> um, Melba is a cultural language teacher for the Washoe Tribe of Nevada and California. Melba is a fluent elder speaker who was born in the foothills of Carson Valley. Melba was raised speaking the Washoe language by her mother, father, and grandparents, and has carried these teachings with her throughout her life sharing her passion for the Washu language and people to all. From 2012 to 2014, Melba taught language at the Patungai. Um, Patungi, Becky. Thank you. <laughs> I don't want to massacre this language. <laughs> the Eagle's Nest, a language immersion classroom for Head Start youth aged three to five years old. 
Melba spent much of her time translating resources to WashU and is incredibly passionate about creating a new generation of speakers to carry on the WashU language in the future. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thank you, Shelly, for setting us up. Um, I thought a lot of the topics that you touched on were point on, especially as far as the losses in our communities of language and culture, um, and on the California side too, the eradication of indigenous people purposefully. I know that we felt that with some of the bounties and things on our side, um, but we were a little higher in the Sierras and weren't as, as badly impacted as a lot of the California tribes. And um, I know it's really tough on that side. And so we appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Muangu Amibi, Washu at Luha Liza Digam Dialei, Debo at Lu Herman Fillmore Digam Dialei, Degoi Benny Fillmore, Ashdi Lot Laura Fillmore Degam Diakei, Ashdi Amma Vernita Snooks Degam Diakei, Wap Ao de Dei Lei, Ash Bawa Lugum Danu Shilu Lei. Um, Hello, everybody. My name is Herman Fillmore. My Washu name is Haliza. My parents are Benny and Laura Fillmore, and my paternal grandmother um, on my Washu side is Vernita Snooks. Um, I'm from the Carson Valley area, as it's known today, and I'm of the people of the valley um, of, of the Washu people. Melba, did you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, let's act like Like a Melba de Gumdia, Kele, Genga de Gumdia, Washu Itlu, the Wailu de Te, Wailu Shi de Le Gangalugi, do Dao Agar thought she did la. Mabel uh, James Washoka, uh, Degoy Raymond Fillmore, uh, the Guu, the uh, Washo Itlu, the Gumdia Kalasha Slewaring, um, Ashki, uh, the Guu, the um, uh, Ini James Washo Cornbread, uh, the Ella. Ki, uh, Whitney Washo, it uh, thought Dooney Cornbread, uh, the Ama Annie Pitts, the Baba Tom Fillmore. Lika Wadding, uh, Deka Wewush to Gallet Kishuela, the Midle Kishua. Um, Ashley Wadding Wagabe, Kimiki Lato Lash Wadding Hamoshuklo, do a guy out here with it, weary Haka. Ashtikang Wetty, um, my name is Melba. Rakow. My my Indian name or my Washo name is Genga. Um, and I'm from the foothills of Gardnerville, Bawalu. <laughs> and uh, my grandmother was from the Woodford's people or the Valley people also. My uh, grandmother on my father's side was definitely from the Colville, uh, uh, Gardnerville area. And um, Tom Fillmore was also from there. So I'm kind of related all over and I wanted to acknowledge the people on that site because they're relatives too. Um, in fact, uh, my great great grandmother was probably related to you directly. So I enjoyed your talk. It was right on. I'm right there. I'm hearing you and I'm feeling you. So now we shall continue and see what we can do. Thank you for having me. Um, Megan, am I able to share my screen? I have a PowerPoint. Yes, let me see if I can make you co-host, if that might help. Thank you. Um, can you see my PowerPoint all right? Yes, it looks great. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna we're gonna do a presentation today. Um, it's gonna be a little different for us um, because I have Melba here as well, and so we may just pop up with some different things throughout. But um, we're gonna touch on the Washishu or the Washu people, um, as we call ourselves Washishu, the Washu people from here. Um, we're a distinct tribe linguistically and culturally from the areas around Lake Tahoe. Um, there are 574 federally recognized tribes. Many of them have different cultures, different histories, stories, and languages. 
When we talk about our language being distinct, we're often kind of classified in a group of languages known as the Hokan language family. Um, it's talked about as sort of a, a group for those languages who didn't fit into the larger language families in North America. So a lot of tribes in California, although very distinct linguistically, are thrown into this branch of language families. And when we do talk about it, we talk about Washu being a distinct branch in that, that language family, in the Hokan language family. So oftentimes when we hear other languages that are grouped into this group, um, we are mutually intelligible. And so we can see that there's really a, a distant connection, if a connection between these languages. Um, much of that is shaped for us, at least on our end, is being isolated from a lot of these tribes in the Sierras. So first of all, I wanna talk about how we talk about ourselves. So our names for ourselves are often Washu. Um, this is kind of the singular version one Washu person or one Washu sing one one thing singular to Washu people. Um, so oftentimes we might say Washu way hegigit or Washu ways of knowing. Um, the other one is Washishu. This is the plural form, more than one Washu person. Um, the reason I bring this up is because oftentimes, especially those in Northern Nevada, you'll see our name spelled as Washo, um, W-S-H-O-E. My understanding is that this was actually supposed to be pronounced washu, um, like the word shu, and, kind of, and in that instance, it is closer to how we recognize ourselves. However, when you look up washu people um, in a lot of the archives and anthropologies, you'll see it is washo with the blatant O at the end. And so when we talk about these things and reclaiming our identity specifically, oftentimes in our communities, it's even about how we refer to ourselves. And so I implore everyone on this call that when you're learning about the tribes um, in, your, in your own homelands or where you may be zooming in from, um, to learn how they refer to themselves. Sometimes the anglicized name um, isn't, isn't what really comes from that language or those peoples. And so it's important to make those contacts and really know how the people prefer to be called. I think one of the things that happens is terminology today. You know, Indian was a popular term for a while. Native Americans are still used. We often refer to ourselves now in more academic settings as indigenous people or aboriginal people, um, really to reflect being the first people or the original peoples of these places. So I wanted to talk um, kind of at first about our homeland. Um, so you can see here we have a map. This was created during the um, Indian Claims Commission. So this isn't necessarily accurate of all of our oral histories, but it gives us a general idea of Washu homeland. You can see at the center, we have here Da'al Aga, known today as Lake Tahoe. Um, the darker green being kind of the, what's known as the main territory and the lighter green being the peripheral territory with trade routes going into California and the Great Basin. Um, a lot of our stories, although not documented in these, really talk about us going as far as the ocean to trade, you know, to gather abalone and other things of that nature. And at one time with the Nevada side being an inland sea, um, our creation stories also talk about coming farther from the West and being from this place. So you can see too, one of the biggest things about us as Washu people is having been in this place for so long, um, we really have been become to be shaped by this place culturally and linguistically. So one of the things I wanted to talk about, um, because it always comes up when indigenous people are mentioned, is the idea that we were only surviving within these homelands until colonization or something came to save us and bring us from our own wretched existence. Um, we truly <laughs> believe this to be kind of misinformation. We, we not only survived here, but we truly thrived within our homeland. As you can see from this map, we have um, extensive knowledge of the various resources that are here not only within our homeland, but surrounding homelands. Um, we have knowledge of all of these places as far as what their traditional names are. And when we talk about it, we talk about these places as, you know, having their own names, having their own existence, and not being something that we gave importance to because all things are important. So I have here, um, and I wanted to talk about this a little bit more in depth. So Tahoe, the word itself today actually comes from a Washu word or known as Da'au. So when we refer to the lake, we called it Da'au or Da'au Aga, so the lake or the edge of the lake. Um, today, that's kind of, as I mentioned with our own name, Washu, has been anglicized to be Tahoe. 
<clears throat> and so oftentimes, even in our community, we, we think it's funny that we would call this Lake Da'au or Lake Lake. Um, the same thing can be said about Mount Talak, which is also in our homeland there at the south side of the lake. Um, the lock is our word for mountain. So Mount, Mount the lock is actually mountain mountain when translating from Washu. Um, what this kind of brings up is that although there's been credence given to indigenous languages when these words are used, it's very tough for them to kind of maintain that existence when there's so many people visiting in an area, changing that information. Um, slowly Englishifying the language to where it's almost unrecognizable to, to original speakers. One, one thing I wanted to talk about briefly in this, in this same kind of breath is the recent name changes here in the area. So we've been lucky enough to have um, true allies in the Forest Service and BLM, and as well as the local kind of towns and, and community governments to want to do better for indigenous people moving forward. I think everyone's kind of probably aware of the uh, Squaw Valley name change that's been happening in the Olympic Valley area here near Tahoe. Um, the, uh, the resort itself where the Olympics happen, um, they've been really good partners in engaging with the tribe to move forward and rebrand that entire area in a way that is truly respectful of indigenous people. Um, the word squaw itself is derogatory and was often used in a derogatory manner by, by non-Native people, non-Indigenous people, to demean our women. Um, and something that was really a part of kind of this colonization or pat patriarchal attitude towards women in general. Um, completely counterintuitive to our beliefs as Indigenous people where we respect our women. Um, and in our community specifically, we often consider ourselves a matriarchal tribe where our women truly led us and we're often the the decision makers. Um, the resort is really doing this in a meaningful way. And I do just want to give credence to our, our TIPO officer, Daryl Cruz, who's gone through and worked with our Washoe Resource, our Washoe Cultural Resource Advisory Council to rename quite a few places, including uh, Squaw Ridge, which is now known as Hungalelti Ridge, um, as well as a few other places that were kind of championed by our, our Hungalelti community chairman, our, our Woodford's community chairman, Irvin Jim. Um, and so we've seen a return of our language to our homeland. And for us, it's a beautiful thing because we, again, talk about these places as having names um, that were given to us and us not naming these places. So you can see around Lake Tahoe too, when we talk about it, um, the place names that we have are related to the tributaries and not necessarily the bays that you see today. Um, for example, the tribe operates Meeks Bay Resort. Um, but we don't have a name for Meeks Bay. We actually call that place, that creek that goes into the bay, um, Mayalawata. So our names were related to those tributaries, um, the lakes, things of that nature, and not necessarily just the bays themselves. And so that also kind of brings up the idea of um, the importance of these places to Washu people and how we saw the world. So instead of the beaches themselves being a tourist destination that was great to be at, we often saw those tributaries into the lake and out of the lake is so important to the survival of the ecosystem as a whole that those are the places that are referenced in our language. Um, I was lucky enough a couple of years ago to visit Aotearoa or New Zealand as it's known to many. Um, and one of the things that I was um, so overwhelmed with was to see their language and their traditional place names throughout their country. So you can see here it's a, it's a bilingual sign with their language posted below. Um, and so one of the things that we often talk about is that, well, we can't necessarily rename all of these places. Um, some of that knowledge has been lost throughout time. We can still do our best to honor these places and recognize them and also recognize the indigenous people of this place. Um, one of the cool things too that I noticed when going to New Zealand is there's the opportunity to have language lessons on the flights as you enter the country. And while it's a separate country, um, as indigenous peoples, we also recognize that each of our homelands, languages and cultures are different. And when going to one another's homelands, it's important to be respectful of those traditions as they may differ from our own. So to be able to see our language throughout our homeland, um, to hear our language spoken in different settings, and even as a way to kind of acknowledge indigenous people's existence by, by visitors, it's incredibly important for us to start to to rebrand and reclaim um, our, our own homelands and names for these things. 
This creates an understanding that indigenous peoples were and are still present, and that although the history of colonization has not been pretty for indigenous peoples, we have opportunities ahead to support indigenous communities and also educate those who reside in the area and visit. This celebration of the cultures from here is important in order to continue to make positive changes in our own backyards as it relates to race and racial tensions and the environment and respect for the environment. So this kind of brings me to my next um, topic for the day. Um, and I'm really glad that Shelly brought this up in her, in her presentation as well. So for us, one of the big things is cultural revitalization in our communities. Um, but that isn't just for the benefit of our own communities. Oftentimes it's for the benefit of our homelands and all of those who enjoy these places. When we talk about indigenous people, we often talk about us as the original stewards of place, um, the caretakers and those things. But we also like to think of it as something deeper than just being stewards and caretakers. We actually come from this place. And even in our language, when we talk, you know, um, I said Pao de Ilei in my introduction. And it literally says, you know, this is the place that I come from. This is the part of who I am. And when we talk about our homeland, we don't just talk about it as something that we live on, but an extension of ourselves. Indigenous communities have always been stewards of the land, but that relationship is much deeper um, to an extent. We not only um, lived in these places and cultivated the resources here, but our, our cultures and our languages truly come from this place to the extent that we, we don't talk about our languages being gone forever. Um, we often talk about needing to reconnect with nature, needing to be able to listen better so that we could hear our language spoken again, um, and to speak to those plants and animals in this place too, because they also um, speak our languages. They also understand us. And I know that that sounds kind of romanticized and like something from the Pocahontas movie, um, but it really is something important to us to be able to connect to this place on a deeper level um, for our actions to actually reflect our, our identity and our ideals. One of the things that Shelly brought up was this idea of TEK. So it's become a hot topic with land management is this traditional ecological knowledge. Um, the questions that always come to our communities is, you know, how did we care for the land? When did we do these different practices? Where were these things done and why were they done? Um, I think a good example that Shelly brought up is fire. So we do have um, the knowledge in our communities that fire was used in a benef beneficial way for our lands. Um, but when you talk to our elders who experience those things and, re and remember seeing them, they don't ever really give you much detail as to how it was done. One example for us is that every year during the fall time, we go out and gather dogum or our pine nuts. Um, and this is an incredibly valuable resource to our people, something that's still cherished by our elders. And it's not just the food source itself, the pine nut, but it's the caring for our pine nut groves, um, the bringing together of our families and teaching the next generation how to care for the land in the same way that it's always happened. Um, you can see in these pictures, we actually have some of our Head Start youth so our three to five year olds who went to the Padongi Meki, the Eagle's Nest, the language immersion nest that Lisa Enos and Michelle both are, um, and Melba both taught at. These little guys came out and picked up pine nuts with us. Um, as some of the adults pulled them from the trees, the little ones picked up the loose nuts and cones. And it really is this entire cultural experience of bringing community and family together not in a way that's to teach everybody what to do, but it's also that experience, um, the joy and laughter that we share. I know one of the big things that our elders tell us to do when caring for these trees is that, you know, we used to remove all of the undergrowth, the brush and things like that. And that helped with the health of these trees. And it also prevented fire. So when we talk about our experiences on land, it's really the totality of that experience that makes up the traditional ecological knowledge. Um, it isn't just one thing that was done at one time to help that forest be healthy, but truly living in that place and caring for it. The next thing I just wanted to talk about briefly, um, and this is this still has to do with our cultural revitalization. So what we have here is a few pictures of community members and tribal members making fishing traps. Um, so we use fishing traps for one of our traditional fishing trips that we do every fall when the Kokanee Salmon Run. Um, the cool part about this is it isn't just the making of the trap that's that's really um, important to our culture, but it's also the gathering of the willow, um, going out to tend our willow groves and take care of those places so that we have healthy willows for our baskets and our traps. 
Um, and so it really, again, goes to tending to the land and using those resources as available in a way that supports our culture, our language, our values, our coming together as Washu people. This is a couple of pictures from our fishing trip. Um, I really like to show these all of the time because it's it was a true learning experience for me. Um, Daryl Cruz started this, I want to say, in about 2010, 2011. So it was prior to me coming back to work for the tribe. Um, and it was one of the first events that I assisted with when I came back as a language teacher. So we, we made our traps with our students and uh, it's hard to see, but here in the bottom left, you can actually, there's a net that one of our tribal members has made, so a traditional fishing net. And when we do this activity, it's all handmade. Um, it's all natural fibers. It's all things that we would have access to as Washu people here in our homelands. And again, it goes back to caring for those groves and places that you gather those materials. The other cool part too is that when we talk about this um, for a community or cultural revitalization, it isn't just that we had experts in our community to teach everybody how to do these things, but often we work together to help make these things successful. Um, you can see here in the top right, there's actually a father and his two daughters there where he's uh, kind of herding the fish towards them so that they can catch them in their traps. One thing I want to note here too with the kokanee salmon is that it's actually an invasive species and very destructive to our homelands. Um, it outcompetes the cutthroat trout, which was endemic to the Tahoe Basin and the surrounding areas. Um, and so as part of this, although we're not here to necessarily eradicate this species, um, we have had conversations with fish and wildlife as this is something understood to need population control um, in order to make that ecosystem as a whole healthier. So this is a unique opportunity for us to be able to practice our traditions, um, take care of our homeland and have these discussions about how to make this place better. I know one of the things that's always tough for us when doing this trip is there's uh, a lot of tourists in the area. So a lot of people who come specifically to see the salmon spawn, they don't know that this is an invasive species. And so when they see us out there, um, we've actually been yelled at by people in the area for practicing our traditions because they see us as harming that species. Um, without kind of understanding too that our language and cultures are also endangered. So our ability to practice these things is incredibly important to our survival. And when we talk about the preservation of our cultures, it isn't to preserve it in a book, um, to preserve it in a video or a teaching manual that someone can go learn to be wash you about. It's truly about passing on these experiences um, and actively practicing them. Um, by having that knowledge in community, it's the best way to ensure its survival and to make sure that we have this knowledge to share with the outside world as well. I think Shelley brought up a good point again in talking about our, our allies, our partners who support our efforts to take care of our homelands. Um, and, and we look to be good allies as well by sharing that knowledge with everyone. The last thing I wanted to talk about briefly is, is really specific to our department. So we are the Culture Language Resources Department for the Washoe Tribe of Nevada and California. Um, I mentioned earlier, our language is kind of is pretty much a language isolate, very unique compared to the other languages in the Hokan language family. Um, and even some of those languages have been removed and determined to truly be language isolates. It becomes tough on our end because although we know we're unique, it still takes science to prove that sometimes. Um, and so being a smaller tribe with around 1400 tribal members, we, we don't necessarily have the resources or specific resource, research done within our community. Um, however, we also understand too that it isn't necessarily about having to prove something, but having that knowledge and being able to tell our own story and express that uniqueness to each and every one of you. Um, so one of the important things about indigenous languages is that each language um, inherently represents a new perspective or a different worldview. Um, for us, and Melba could talk about this more, but when we talk about our language, it's incredibly descriptive. You know, it often paints a picture to the listener of exactly what the speaker was seeing um, and what they viewed when talking. So in order for us um, to continue to move forward, one of the biggest obstacles we face for language and culture um, at the federal level, state level, and what have you, is a lack of funding for our language programs. Um, it's, it's one of the things where we are a small tribe, 1400 tribal members, um, and whereas the rest of the world is um, in need of resources and things of that nature too, it's really hard to convince everybody of the importance of these unique languages and its benefit to the rest of the world. 
So what we currently do is we have our youth after school language classes. Melba also teaches an adult language class, but these have been interrupted due to COVID-19 and not being able to meet in person. And so we've had a little bit of a tough time trying to transition to use social media or other digital platforms, but it's become something that we're a little bit more experienced with and comfortable with over this last year. And we hope to integrate those things into our language moving forward. The last thing that I wanted to uh, mention, and it's, it's always sad to talk about, but with our language, we are currently classified as a moribound language. Um, this kind of means that without extensive work being done on our language, as is being done now and more that needs to be done in the future, um, we won't have any living speakers left of our language um, within the next 20 to 30 years. We currently have a handful of fluent elder speakers um, that number has changed recently, um, but we still talk about it being around 10, um, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less fluent elder speakers, um, depending upon who you ask. So it also kind of brings up, and this is something that I wanted to mention since this, since this was a presentation um, to the libraries and about literacy, um, is this idea of fluency in our languages. So we do have varying levels of fluency and comprehension, um, but I wanted to set this up in a way that I hope makes sense, but as it relates to fluency and literacy. So I, I just quickly took these definitions, but fluency is the ability to speak or write a foreign language easily and accurately, um, further defined as the ability to express oneself easily and articulately. Um, literacy being the difference is the ability to read and write, um, competence or knowledge in a specific area. And so we, uh, we have a lot of Washu tribal members who have extensive knowledge of the language and culture. Um, we only truly have a handful that are fluent and can speak in all of these different um, areas of expertise, kind of these domains as we talk about them in language and literacy. So it's very tough um, at this time for our communities to move forward with language revitalization um, without creating new speakers and teachers to move forward in the future. And so um, I just wanna thank you all for your time. And I will end that with a quick picture of our language. So you can see we have a bunch of different symbols. Um, this makes it tough for language learners at times, um, but for us, it's incredibly important to document our language, um, both through recordings um, and, and handwritten materials as those are often required to teach classes. Um, so we can see here, I just wanted to show you guys real quick, but um, here on the right hand side, you see some of these different symbols like the glottal stop. Um, although these things aren't necessarily important in English, they are present, but in our language, it is important for the integrity of it, um, the literacy portion, as well as the fluency. And so um, as we kind of continue to move forward as a tribe, our department is, is dedicated to the revitalization, the teaching of our language and culture. And while that entails so much from documentation, um, to interactions with elder speakers and having conversations in the language. We, we truly wish the best for our people moving forward and hope to be able to accomplish these goals. Dinga, ladishinga, that's all I'll say. I know we went a little over our time limit. I apologize on that. But I did just want to ask Melba if she had a couple of anything that she wanted to add at the time. Um, yes. Hold on, my speaker. Ring. Okay, is it? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, okay? we can hear you. Okay. We can hear you, Melba. All right, thanks. Um, one of the things I'm going to add to what Herman said was our language wasn't a written language to start with, but basically, those times have passed, and you have to see that we may not like the language written, but it is having to be written in order to keep it alive today. I, I myself do not, I'm not truly involved in the written part because I find that the more I write, the more I change the way the actual language was spoken. So I, I, have, I have a hard time with breaking it down. And when you're breaking it down, you end up Englishifying the language. So I try very hard to stay away from that portion, though everybody else in the group can do it and I'll speak it and they can do it and break it down. And I think that's a happy, happy marriage, so to speak. <laughs>
but um, we were going to tell a story today and I know we've run over so um, I would just like to say well thanks for listening to me and listening to Herman of course but uh, I am in hopes that we can create some speaker and I keep telling Herman that he's right there he just needs to put it together and so I, I, I guess I'll have to beat him with a stick that's our good things being elder <laughs> didn't say what kind of stick <laughs> so anyway thank you for having me thank you so much for joining us today thank you all um um Wong Ellie, you you've all done good for being here Awesome. I'm so excited and I have so many questions. <laughs> I just want to conversate. Oh boy. Uh, yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, I will go ahead then. And um, we do have question and answers at the end. Um, so, you know, I encourage everybody to, to hang on to your, your thoughts if you can do that. All right. So I will introduce our keynote speaker who is Suzanne Harjo president of the Morning Star Institute, poet, writer, lecturer, and policy advocate who has helped native peoples protect sacred places and recover more than 1 million acres of land. She has developed key laws in five decades to promote and protect native nations, sovereignty, children, arts, cultures, and languages, including the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, National Museum of the American Indian Act, and Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. I have to just pause and say, if you don't know what these acts are, please look them up if you're interested. These are the cornerstones of Native American revitalization efforts and protection of culture. Um, they're the biggies. <laughs> Dr. Harjo is the first Native American woman to receive an honorary doctorate of humanities from the Institute of American Indian Arts in 2011. The first Vine Deloria Jr. Distinguished Indigenous Scholar, University of Arizona 2008 and a 2013 Deloria Lecturer. The first person to be awarded back-to-back -back fellowships by the School of Advanced Research in Poetry and as a summer scholar in 2004 and the first Native woman to be honored as a Montgomery Fellow from Dartmouth College in 1992. Past Executive Director of the National Congress of American Indians, she serves as Legislative Liaison for the Native American Rights Fund and in the Carter Administration was lead plaintiff in Harjo et al. versus Pro Football Incorporated, 1992 to 2009 the landmark lawsuit against the despairing name of the Washington professional football franchise. A founding trustee of the National Museum of the American Indian, she is a guest curator and general editor of NMAI's treaties, Great Nations in Their Own Words, opening and publication in 2014, and an ongoing winning columnist for Indian Country Today Media Network. She is of Cheyenne and oh, Hudolgi, Muskogee Heritage. Please correct me if I said that wrong. And please welcome Suzanne Harjo. Well, thank you very much. I had planned a wonderful fake background for you, but you'll have to do with this. <laughs> so <laughs> pardon my lack of te technological expertise here. Uh, you pronounced that exactly right. Beautiful. Uh, Thank you, Suzanne. And let's see, have I done something strange here to the image or not? I think you look fine. <laughs> no, I, 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 what I'm saying is, is uh, looks like a nuclear, uh, like the mushroom cloud from a nuclear blast. <laughs> Oh, the lighting behind you. No, I think we're all seeing you fine. No, no, no. no it's in an it's a picture. That's what I'm seeing. But okay. Um, I'll pretend I don't see that. <laughs> you pronounced Hodogi exactly right. That means wind. 
and um, that's the the first clan of the Muscogee Nation peoples and the clan that named all the other clans. All the other clans are named for uh, animals. They were the first thing that the Hidalgis saw when they came out of the other world. And so the others are all deer, eagle, and the like, big cat. And we're the odd ones out and uh, others have said very nice things about the Wind Clan people. I was raised um, as both Muscogee and Cheyenne. I am a Cheyenne national. I'm an enrolled citizen of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes in Oklahoma. And I live and work in Washington, DC and have for a long time. I'm a grandmother and, um, oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. This is Zoom, not a TV studio. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I'm a grandmother and uh, of course mother, and I'm very proud of that. Um, I'm proud of everything I've done almost and uh, the things I uh, might not be so proud of, you'll never know about. <laughs> but I thank you for bringing me here and for uh, virtually here and for asking me to address some of the issues that you're dealing with right now. I mean, what you're dealing with is something that every Native nation has had to deal with in establishing a relationship with the United States. So nearly 600 have done that so far. You are in the category of those who have done it before. So you know you can do it again. And the worst of the US policies stepped in and did a really dirty trick and um, forgot to undo it for you and just two others while they undid it for many others uh, in California. California took real body blows from the European invasions. Many people think that the Mayflower, that Columbus landed on the, in the islands or on the islands, uh, the Mayflower landed in the what's now the Northeast United States. And then everyone from Europe pretty much worked their way from the East Coast to the West Coast. It didn't happen like that, of course. The people uh, in the metal hats who came with Columbus, along with their rats and fleas and all of those horrendous diseases that we still haven't developed full immunity from. And, and that's uh, everything from measles to mumps to cholera to diphtheria to uh, malaria, everything that was brought here by the Europeans, uh, we still have not developed full immunity to. Our people die at a rate higher uh, than any other people's from influenza, from tuberculosis, from pneumonias. This is that this is what preceded Columbus. As soon as the rats and the fleas and the men with the hairy faces and the metal heads got off those ships, they sent into the hemisphere, into this turtle island, this red quarter of Mother Earth the scourges that they brought with them. And that cleared the way for them to think that there was an empty space in the, on the earth just waiting for them to populate. Of course, they had to ignore the evidence of great civilizations, they had to ignore the evidence of many bodies of people 
dying and dead, people diseased, people in trouble. And if there were people left alive, as many were, they were able to with superior weapons begin to eradicate the people. They kept some who they wanted to fill thimbles with gold. And if they couldn't do that fast enough, uh, they were maimed, one hand cut off, one foot cut off, which was tantamount to a death sentence because infection would set in very quickly and you couldn't really make your way in the world with that kind of maiming all of a sudden and in such a punitive way. This all preceded anyone going from the east coast of what is now the United States to the west coast. This invasion took place through what is now Central America and the people went up the West Coast once they hit there. And so at a time when the United States was making treaties with native peoples, there had already been devastation and extermination and displacement and disruption of people's lives from which people still are recovering today. No matter how good the circumstances are today, no matter how many great casinos a nation might have today in California, there are still injuries and wounds and scars that need attending to and the job is not finished of restoration. So when the people of the United States, those three treaty makers were sent to make treaties for the United States with the native peoples in California they did their best. They did a very good job. They took good notes. They met the people. They were friendly. They conducted diplomacy. They undertook the serious work of the United States meeting people of who represented other nations that the United States wanted to have interaction with and wanted to have an agreement with. They made treaties. They made treaties that at the same time that treaties were being made in the Great Plains, for example. Uh, I remember looking at the congressional record, at the record of the Journal of Proceedings of the Senate, of the United States Senate, and just checking some things on the Great Horse Creek Treaty, the Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1851, involving most of the Plains Native nations. 1851. Now that's when the treaty commissioners were there in California. It was at the same time, but what happens a few pages later in the Journal of Proceedings of the Senate is that the Senate rejects those treaties that were made in good faith by the native peoples in California and by the treaty commissioners. One treaty commissioner kept writing to the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Department of the Interior and anyone else he could try to get the attention of to say, please do something about these treaties. The uh, people are, are getting anxious and other people are coming in and hurting them and moving them. And we gave our assurance, we gave our word. So what happened? Well, what happened was the white supremacists who were in charge of California as territory turned state, who had been responsible in Oregon territory, for example, for the Chinese exclusion, 
we're trying to do the equivalent of an Indian exclusion along with a Chinese exclusion. They were looking at a black exclusion. They wanted white people and the gold. What they did instead was to contact the Senate and the, United, and the president and say, don't enter into these treaties. Don't ratify the treaties in California. So as the Senate was making the Treaty of Horse Creek, it did not make the treaties with the peoples in California. It voted not to. And why? Because it had been petitioned by the California legislature, by the California governor, and by people who were very, very wealthy and about to become even more wealthy from the gold in the brand new state and the richest state, California. And still, without even knowing this had happened, the commissioners were writing and saying, I entreat you, please keep faith with these treaties and do something. We promise security and we have to provide at least security. That never happened. And as you know, far better than I, the people were either mowed down or moved. And some people never, some peoples never recovered from that. Some peoples are still reeling from that. And to add in, insult to injury and injury to insult, because there were too many to even know which came first, but there was a great piling on of both policy and practice with bounty proclamations by companies and the state and local municipalities and cities for dead Indians. It was business. It was good business for there to be dead Indians. There were some Indians who worked for the miners, just as there were some good Indians who worked for the priests when the mission when the missionizing of California happened. One of your great artists, Harry Fonseca, who always told everyone he was Nisnan, always, and who always drew on that history and who was a very subtle person and a very specific artist, did an extraordinary series of work just of walls and walls of small, just very small, eight by 10, eight by 11 um, paintings of crosses, gold crosses representing, of course, the gold and of course the Christianization of the people, the missionizing, the missionization of the people, the forced labor of the native people to work to build these beautiful missions, to farm the, the natural beauty and orchards of paradise where you all live. And he made, he, Harry, made each of his crosses, his gold crosses, and they were very different from one another. Some had splatters of blood, some had, some were crooked, some were pristine, some were gilt edged, some were just splashed with gold. At the bottom of every one, was a landscape of black and red. And the black and red was for 
fresh and dried blood. You looked closely and saw that that's what it was. It wasn't just a rolling hills at sunset. It was a history written in blood. Now that's what California has been. And it continued to be, it continued to call on the federal government each time that the native peoples would, would be able to get a short, just a small handhold into or out of poverty or into an education opportunity or into a business opportunity or people were as we just heard, revitalizing their languages. Just when these things would start to happen, California would prevail on Congress to do something else. And Congress would oblige as it did with the Termination Act. So you have a situation where people are, by golly, just terminated. The federal tribal relationship severed, ended. There were at the time, and this was done by the do-gooders, by the way, this was done by the people who meant well, because at that time, there were generally two kinds of people uh, in America. Well, I'll say three, three who, a third in, in the not in, not in the above uh, category. The first uh, kind was uh, the, the standard white supremacist who wanted to have nothing of uh, people of color, certainly not anything to do with native peoples. And why? Because they'd done so much bad to native peoples. So they were the exterminationist. And then there were people who had more of a heart. They didn't want to kill everyone, but they didn't think anyone else was their equal. So they wanted some hierarchical situation in policy, and they wanted a way of deterring the too rapid advance of any Native peoples or any people of color. And why were they doing this? Well, they were doing it because they thought that once in charge, the native people and other peoples of color, Asians and blacks, everyone, Latinas, ev everyone would do as bad to them as much bad to them as they had done to us. That's not our history. That's not who we are. That's not who we have ever been. Yet, that is the deep lurking fear that we experience and what's behind it. Yes, guilt is behind it, yes, fear that they're going to lose all their advantages and they will not be able to run roughshod over us. Uh, well, this is, you know, enough days have passed where that really doesn't wash. Yet the remnants of this other stuff, which is just as deadly, you have the fast genocide and the slow genocide suffocating poverty suffocates and you can't suffocate for very long without dying. You can't suffocate for very long without it affecting your uh, even ability to learn, let alone your opportunities. So you have to end this uh, long-term debilitated state. And that is what many people today still aren't prepared to let happen. 
we see this very much today in the news in Georgia, where because primarily black and brown people got out to vote in record numbers, in record ways, in inventive and creative ways, it's being stopped. You have white legislators who are saying, we've had enough of that. So we see a tremendous backlash to any sort of successful assertion of rights, of any kind of rights, treaty rights, inherent sovereign rights, civil rights, human rights, any kind of rights when there is a successful assertion of any of them. And by successful can just mean simply standing up on your feet and saying no. Standing up on your feet and saying, this is what we're going to do now. There always will be a backlash. The only good news is that once you reach agreement whether it's in a treaty, whether it's in a law, whether it's in a, a court decision or a piece of legislation. Once you reach agreement, you're then partners. So if I have a bit of, adv of, of advice, it's know when you've won and know when your greatest opponent has as much stake as you do in making a success of what you've agreed to do in order to stop being opponents. We faced that with the Smithsonian Institution after decades and decades and, and centuries of uh, dealing with it and it not dealing with native peoples and instead amassing great collections and keeping great, taking great collections from others of um, horrendous things. Our nightmares, many of our nightmares are people's nightmares. Things that happen to us in history are features of that institution. They have the collection of Native skulls from the Army, Sur the United States Army Surgeon General's Indian Crania study, an official study of the United States government of the late 1800s. I mean, right after 10 years or so after the. Uh, hello. Hello, hello, I'm on a Zoom presentation, oh. if you don't mind. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Lovely people. And uh, this this happens. So some people have dogs that bark and others <laughs> have people who just come in ever so pleasant and are embarrassed. So uh, you'll bear with us. What, what happened with the Indian Crania study when that started was, ju was just a little over 10 years after the Senate decided not to ratify the California Indian treaties to honor what the new friend the new rich friend, the new richest kid in the world friend had requested, had demanded, had asserted that those treaties remain unratified. It was only 10 years later that there was a formal study of the United States of Indian heads. And they collected them, they advertised in newspapers. They worked later, the Army Medical Institute and, and the uh, Smithsonian Museum as it was first called, 
teamed up to advertise in newspapers for people to go out and harvest Indian crania, to harvest Indian remains. They didn't say remains. They said skeletons and specimens and all sorts of things that uh, were pretty insulting. And people sent them human remains and sacred objects and funerary objects from graves they had disturbed, from caves, from battlefields. They, they sent them all sorts of things. And so you have massive collections, not just with the Smithsonian and not just with the Army Medical Museum, but these federal institutions and then the entire U University of California educational system, uh, Berkeley, uh, others have massive collections from this kind of policy, not necessarily from the Indian Crania study, but from simply exhuming people all over the place from their, what they thought was going to be their final resting place or what should have been, and then declaring those as their own property. And there are actual people at some of these universities who think of themselves as the owners of an entire people. Pretty, pretty strange and, and pretty um, frightening what has been done. And I bring this up to say, this is the origin of what you are encountering and what a lot of native people in California have been able to work themselves out of because they don't have that kind of continuing policy hammering against progress. You have that and need to move to uh, legislation or another route that will uh, executive order, some route that will undo this hideous termination for the last remaining, the three remaining tribes in California that had this done to them while everyone else was, was restored so that you can continue in your progress. And I just have to applaud your remarkable gumption to this stage, your ability to find yourselves, which is no easy task, and to do what can be done while struggling to force the United States and California to do right by you as it needs to do, as it must do. And you have so many people of goodwill working with you, Judith Lowry, another great artist that, that she has uh, begun work with you is, is phenomenal. And one of the best archeologists uh, in, in uh, the country and maybe in the world, uh, Brian Daniels um, from the Cultural Heritage Center run by my old friend, uh, Richard Leventhal at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, these are people of goodwill who, who are not white supremacist and, they're, and they want to stop white supremacy and the things that flow from them. And they want people to, um, to take their righteous place. And so the fact that you have help from native people who have succeeded in their fields uh, and that you have help from non-native people who have succeeded in their fields and who have a special obligation they feel to do right by you is uh, a testament to your ability to receive that goodwill and to make something permanent of it. 
perhaps that alarm here in the DMZ <laughs> is, is a good time for me to conclude. <laughs> Thank you for, for having me here and for, um, for allowing me to, to extend to you both condolences for what has happened in the past and to celebrate you for what you are going through and how you are going through the, through this uh, and for what is to come because that's going to be glorious for you. Aho. Oh, Suzanne, thank you so much. Um, boy, I, I just can't, it, it's hard to express. I feel we're so in a, <laughs> uh, we're such a hole here in Grass Valley in Nevada County sometimes like I feel like sometimes we're in the past and and yet fringes of our community are Berkeley-esque you know we've we've got we're on the edge too with um making movements and I mean if nothing else we find that creative way to to come together and to to stand in what seems like such an I mean, overwhelming everything that you've said, the um, the overwhelming odds that still keep people down um, all the time. And and I, I just appreciate it so much. We, we don't get I feel like we don't get seen often that we're sort of literally at the, the you know, the very tail, tail, tail end of something that is almost forgotten. And yet. Um, you know, like the the Washu people that were speaking, like there were models being made by other folks that I hope um, can help scale this chasm of of just muck. <laughs> you know, for <laughs> lack of a better word, it's, it's all mucky. And <clears throat> having somebody um, like you all you know, narrating on on these topics, this this arc of time, that you know the the policies you talked about, the these acts that literally Indians could not express their religion, they could not keep their children in the homes. That you know earlier than that, like you couldn't vote. Get the people who ran the first California legislation were the Indian killers. They were the ones who were making the money from these bounties and and that anything survives today is constantly, um, and, you know, I think of, I get all emotional all the time, but um, I think of my ancestors and my grandma and grandpa and what they went through. And um, my grandpa had a sibling that died at Haskell in a boarding school, um, but I didn't know any of this. I wasn't taught, I, I experienced it. And then I'm trying to, you know, understand, I guess, and understanding why they were so invisible, like why they learned, everybody in the family learned, you don't, an nobody answers the door, nobody picks up the phone, nobody, you know, uh, opens official looking letters. I have, I, strangely, I have this, some of these phobias, I guess, <laughs> you know, who's, who's it going to be at the door today? You know, there's, there's this scaredness that always lends to that invisibility. And then finding myself at this arc and trying not to further torment my family by saying, we need to be visible. You know, I want to know, can I interview you here? Look in the camera, you know, trying to, when I first met Judith, you know, she was, um, literally that a picture is worth, uh, worth a thousand words, um, taking my photo. And then she, you know, we did a joint article in news from native California and like, she put me on the cover and I was very heavy at the time. And I don't think I had any makeup on or anything. And I'm like, Oh, you know, that was not my, if I was ever going to be a cover girl, that would have not been the moment, but, you know, doing, I guess I'm the one who I, I'm always pretty good, you know, and I, I delve into these, that muck and I, and I just, part of me just cries for the, for humanity. Like, how can we be so icky? How can that, how can people be so disturbed and just not just killing people because you want the land, like, oh, kill them all and then go do what you're going to do. But this, the depravity that is linked with so much of the history across our continent, that's just 
twisted and especially against the women and and you know the slavery um stuff that happened and and that any of us survive today with a bit of stamina and and pride and hope i guess hope is the biggest thing um you know i just want to help bring people out of the moment you were talking about they're still languishing and with the pride and the violence and the drug use and the all the stuff they're they're self-medicating this thing that is because of all this and and so it, it just feels so good to um you all spoke today in such a, a i feel a better i tend to talk in circles and i work things out as I'm speaking sometimes and I come to these realizations like, wow, oh my goodness, and trying to put it all together. Um, when it seems so simple, like put the, our name back on the list, there's a list of tribes, can't you just like put our name back on? <laughs> it seems so simple in the, in the quagmire of things that are hard and very complex. And this does not seem like restoring the terminated tribes like seems super simple that President Nixon was the one who stopped the termination era. I was I was shocked to learn that and I was shocked to learn that he started the EPA because my visions and knowledge of him is not that, you know, and it, I'm like, if Nixon can do it, you know. <laughs> can't can we move past this and make it right so i just um i just feel bubbly with the with being seen i also wanted to say how much i appreciated your um exhibit at the smithsonian about the treaties um i know this that must have been so much research and so much work and but presenting that information to folks who just don't know they just don't know and i i get to a part where I, I, I'm not a bitter person and I don't like to blame people. Um, and when people don't know, then let's educate them. And then once they're educated, you know, let's, once you know, then you know you need to pick up the ball, I think, and at least um, hold part of it or something. So, uh, but all of that just, um, it feels fabulous to speak with you today, Suzanne. And uh, I appreciate your attention to, your knowledge is just um, and what you've done for you know Indian country uh, throughout your life and career has just affected so many people and it, it's so important and I know the work isn't done like we still have so far to go and um, I just I just I appreciate you today so much and you're so well spoken I, I look back on my presentations and I say um you know, um, and, and, and I, I have, and you just speak so well, and it's all so concise, and um, it filters in in such a great way, and I just appreciate it so much. Mm. Yes, thank you so much, Suzanne. And thank you, Shelly. Um, thank you. It is about that time for questions. If anyone has any questions that they would like to share, you can put it in the Q&A. We, we will take a look at the chat and make sure we haven't missed any there. And also in the comments section on Facebook, we're, we're keeping an eye on that. So please feel free to ask any questions at this time. You can raise your hand and ask your question out loud if you'd like. Um, but I thank you so much to all of our panelists for, for sharing. Um, and if we don't get any questions in the next couple of minutes, I, I'm wondering if we can invite Melba and Herman to share that story that you had prepared. Um, so I would love to hear that as well if there's since we have a moment, I do see that someone has asked a question. So can anyone who would like share how you feel about pretensions and blood quantum? I'm not sure I understand that question. About what? Uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> uh, mm. pretensions. It's in quote, quotation marks. So yeah, I'm not sure what that, what that question was about. Pretensions. How do you spell it? Oh, it's, uh, oh, they, they give a different spelling. Um, pre, P R E T E N D I A N S. Oh, pretendings. Oh, pretendings. Yeah, okay. pretendings. Okay. okay. There we go. And, and blood quantum. Well, two separate subjects. Um, let's see. Uh, blood quantum. I, 
I wrote an, a column one time, a long time ago, but it was reprinted fairly recently in, in a good book on this whole subject. And it, it was called um, uh, Vampire Policy, Blood Quantums Be Gone. <laughs> Uh, it, you know, it's, it's an artificial construct and, and people, uh, white people, Euro-American people came up with the idea that it would take about four generations for us to breed ourselves out of existence if we did nothing but marry non-natives. And so from that notion, which was just what some people thought, there developed a, a policy of quarter blood requirement to be native because that's the, that would be the last of the generations to breed themselves out of existence according to the white breeding policy. Well, I mean, what a, what a ridiculous policy. First of all, it, well, there's so many first of alls that it, it was, it was in, it was in contention with the, with the federal government's own policy, another genocidal policy of removing native children from their homes and families and from their lands and so as to lessen their their attachment to the land to lessen their attachment to the culture to lessen their attachment to their parents and grandparents and their full extended families uh, so that was uh, that was a genocidal plan i mean keep in mind when you talk about genocide it doesn't mean you just wipe out all the people. It means the attempt to wipe out all the people, something that was pointed in that direction. The Indian Removal Act of Andrew Jackson was a genocidal policy. It, it was not simply ethnic cleansing, although that would be bad enough. It was removing people from Georgia. Remember, as Georgia goes, so goes the nation. So watch out, watch what happens in Georgia. It's the same policy that has existed there since Andrew Jackson. Having a problem with people of color, get them out of your state. And that's what was behind the Indian Removal Act. So here you have blood quantums coming up at the same time, you know, these quarter blood requirements at the same time that Indian children were being moved into boarding schools very far from their families, very far from their homes, and were being deculturalized and detribalized as a policy, were being Christianized and uh, anglicized and given, it, you, you were beat up if you spoke English. My father was beat up for speaking English when he didn't know anything but Muscogee. I mean, that's, um, that's a sad and horrible thing. And he ended up uh, making with uh, other boys from Shalako Indian Boarding School, a, a code during World War II. And um, based on the coordinates at Shalako and all sorts of different like, uh, phrases and words from different languages, of people who were in Company C in the 45th Inf Infantry Division, Thunderbird Division. And uh, they did this uh, in basic training and on the troop ship to North Africa. And they used that code uh, to help win World War II uh, up uh, through Sicily and Southern Italy and, and arriving not my dad, he was shot up, um, uh, almost lost his life, but happily did not at Monte Cassino. And so he didn't make Rome by D-Day, but that was the push from North Africa was getting 
uh, the Southern Front ready for D-Day. So all of this was, uh, so here, here my father was using his Muscogee language and lots of other languages that were spoken or the words and phrases known of at Shilako in order to win a war to defend our countries. Uh, people are often puzzled about why it is that so many of our people are in the army. Well, these are our countries. Of course, we're going to defend them. Mm -hmm. These are, uh, we didn't come here from other places. We have the, our, our old homelands are here. Our old countries are here. That's who we are. So of course we're going to defend them. And we have most of us uh, treaties with the United States of peace and friendship. And we really mean that. And if our allies are in trouble, we're going to help. So there, there are economic reasons, there are all sorts of other reasons, but those are the big ones. And people who don't know that just don't know who we are. So here they were doing all of these great things. And my father went on to um, learn other, many other languages and, and to, be a, to make up codes and decode messages for a very long time. He only stuttered in one of the many languages he knew and spoke, and that was Muscogee. Why? Because he was beat up in the lunch line for saying, let's go eat, boy. Let's go have some food, boy. This is what you do. You invite people to eat. You invite people to share in what you have. You invite people to be with you as a way. That's a protocol for Indian country. And he would be beat up for that. Um, so I go into that detail to let you know that there are the policies were real in the boarding schools, even in the 1900s when my dad, uh, in the early 1900s, the 20s and 30s, when my dad was in boarding school, um, they, this was still happening. So you have these policies that are contradictory because the boarding schools weren't preparing you to marry out and breed yourself out of existence. The boarding schools were, were showing you, they were introducing you to, to lots of people you might otherwise not meet from different nations, many from your own nation you might not otherwise know. And they were encouraging by the, the proximity, intermarriage, intramarriage and not encouraging this breeding out kind of thing. What they were trying to, but here you have an, a real encouragement by federal government and uh, the people who were anthropologists and other scientists uh, trying to tell us what to do, who would say, if a person uh, when, when your people are one quarter native, you're no longer native. So that has to be stopped. And that and it was stopped by the U.S. courts and uh, in the 70s. Ever since the 70s, mm -hmm. we, we have the right to, um, we have the affirmed right by the United States that we are the sole determiners of our citizenship citizenry of our citizenship standards and who we are. So all of that really is so important to, to keep in mind. Uh, only the native nations can decide who is a native. Whether, whether the native nation is recognized by the federal government or not, you still know who your people are. And that's, that's a, a very important exercise of your own sovereignty, your own inherent sovereignty is saying who your people are. Here's who we are. Here, here, here is our collective face to the world. So that's an extraordinary thing. And pretendians are, are people who are just fakes, who are exploiting native people 
by saying they are native people and trying to take the place of, of many and um, who, uh, who in fact aren't. You, you ask them, who are you? Where, who are your people? And, and uh, they tell you and the people say, huh? <laughs> yeah. And if that's the reaction from the nation itself, from the from the Pueblo, from the tribe, from the rancheria, from the people themselves, then they're pretending. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. And it, it, of course, there's a gulf in between of people who are struggling with their own identity. And that is not to be overlooked because nations and tribes are made up of people and people have messy lives even the most treated, the most recognized, the most linguistically intact, the most religiously intact peoples have messy, messy lives. And, and that's something not to be discounted and always to be factored in and to undertake policies that <clears throat> would do our ancestors proud and help us survive into the future the way they helped us survive into the future. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Uh, we have one last quick question. Is there something you are working on now and can you share a bit with us? Well, we're about to go into um, workshopping a, um, a play that we had performed, uh, myself and Mary Catherine Nagel, uh, who is Cherokee and a wonderful playwright and an attorney, um, a partner in uh, the Pipe Stem Law Firm. Uh, she and I wrote a play, uh, our second play together. Uh, then, and it, um, it was presented at uh, the, in Denver by the, the Denver Performing Arts Center mm. and at the beginning of last year. And it was very successful, got standing ovations and we were very excited to see who would try, who, would, who had been there and who would be asking for scripts. And we were thrilled that people had been there and were asking for scripts and we wondered where we would take this next. And um, then the lights went out on Broadway. Mm -hmm. So um, we have just gotten, uh, I can't jump the gun, but we have just gotten an opportunity to workshop this. I, and part of it is I, about identity. Part of it is about the, um, was it, the very things we're talking about. Uh, who are you and, and how are you and, and do you have false persona laid on top of you, bad reputations put on you, your good name ruined by things like sports mascots and, and um, butter maidens and the like. And so part of this was, a, was about the Washington football team. So in our hiatus uh, during the pandemic, the Washington football team finally, after decades and decades of fighting, uh, changed its name to what we've been calling it since we sued the, the team owners in 1992, the Washington football team. So I thought that was pretty ironic. And so now we're, we, we do need to change the ending somewhat and um, make it more about, uh, about some of the, put the spotlight on some of the other teams that still carry on this despicable practice. And it's one of those leftovers from the extermination versus termination days that, and so we will, so watch this space and I'll send out a notice to everyone about when we're going to, to have this workshop and when we, you might have a chance to um, be one of our audiences. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and unfortunately, that is our, our time for today. But thank you 
uh, to all of our wonderful panelists. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, uh, Herman and Melba. And thank you, Shelley, for, for all of your, your, your one, for everything that you've shared with us today. It's been absolutely fascinating and, and wonderful to hear from you. And I, I hope we can keep going and, and hear more in the future. Thank you as well to the Nevada County Community Library staff who helped support and put together this program. And thank you to our community for joining us today and for your participation throughout the Nevada County Reads and Writes 2021. Your voices are an important part of this program and the conversation that we have had. Um, and we are honored to share this moment with you and of course with all of our panelists. Um, so thank you everyone for today. And um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thanks for having us. Thank you all. Maliki Gabuki. We'll see you in the future. Thank you. Bye-bye.